It's all a coincidence. I'm thrilled to introduce Colson Whitehead, the author of five novels and a collection of essays on New York City. His novels include The Intuitionist and most recently his brainy zombie tale, Zone One, a novel. This sounds very woo. Is this going to be hard for you to read with this? There's this? Okay. Um, which he will be reading from this evening. His nonfiction has appeared in multiple publications, including the New York Times, Salon, and the Village Voice. White has received a number of awards, including the White End Award and the much coveted MacArthur Fellowship. Please join me in welcoming Colson Whitehead. Thank you. So, uh, howdy. Thanks so much for coming out. Uh, I think we're safe from a hurricane or a tornado in here. Uh, no windows. So whenever I can, I like to uh, share work in progress uh, when I'm traveling on my publisher's dime. No, actually, it was not very expensive to come here because I live here. Um, at any rate, so I'd like to share a project I've been working on for a little bit of, a little bit of a while. Um, uh, I realized that there comes a moment in every writer's life when it is time to edit an anthology. So a year and a half ago, I started assembling an anthology on the writer's craft. Uh, I'm calling it How to Write and the Art of Writing. Writers writing about writing. Um, the idea is simple. Today's best writers on the topic of their choice. Uh, in short, writers writing about writing. So one of the first people to get back to me when I sent out my letters to many prominent people in the publishing industry um, was Jim Phillips, who contributed the following wonderful essay that I'll read to you called How to Write. Um, Jim Phillips, of course, is the author of several works of fiction, including the novels Can't Get There From Here, You Gotta Know When to Fold Them, and the award-winning colloquial phrase I will use as a title. Last year he published the acclaimed work of cultural history, Ding Dang Dong, The True Story of Frere Jaca, Methamphetamine, and Chronic Insomnia. How to write. The art of writing can be reduced to a few simple rules. I share them with you now. Rule number one, show and tell. Most people say show, don't tell, but I stand by show and tell. Because when writers put their work out into the world, they're like little kids bringing their broken unicorns and chewed up teddy bears to class in the sad hope that someone else will love them as much as they do. And what do you have for us today, Marcy? A penetrating psychological study of a young med student who receives disturbing news from a former lover. How marvelous, have a juice box. And you, Timmy, what are you holding there behind your back? It's a Calvino-esque romp through an unnamed metropolis, much like New York, narrated by an armadillo. Such an imagination. Have a juice box. Show and tell, followed by a good nap. Rule number two, don't go searching for your subject. Let your subject find you. You can't rush inspiration. How do you think Truman Capote came to In Cold Blood? It was just an ordinary day, and he picked up the paper to read his horoscope, and it was right there, fate. Whether it's a harrowing account of a multiple homicide, a botched Everest expedition, or a family of colorful singers trying to escape from Austria when the Nazis invade, you can't force it. Once your subject finds you, it's like falling in love. It'll be your constant companion shadowing you, peeping in your windows, calling you at all hours of the night to leave messages like, only you understand me. Your ideal subject should be like a stalker with limitless resources. He's in your apartment, pawing your stuff when you're not around, using your toothbrush, and cutting out all the really good synonyms from the, thes from the thesaurus. Don't be afraid you have a bestseller on your hands. Rule number three, write what you know. Saul Bellow once said, fiction is the higher biography. In other words, fiction is payback on those who have wronged you. When people read my first two books, 
my gym teacher was an abusive bully, and she called them Brussels sprouts, a survivor's tale. <laughs> They're often surprised when I tell them that there's an autobiographical element to them. Therein lies the art, I say. How do you make that, which is your every day, into the stuff of art? Listen to this. Listen to your heart. Ask your heart, is it true? And if it is, let it be. Once the lawyer sign off on it, you're good to go. <laughs> Rule number four, never use three words when one will do. Be concise. Don't fall in love with a gentle trilling of your mellifluous sentences. Learn how, you, how to kill your darlings, as they say. I'm reminded of, of the famous editor-author interaction between Gordon Lish and Raymond Carver when they were working on Ray Carver's celebrated short story, Those Life Preservers Are Just For Show, <laughs> often considered the high watermark of so-called dirty realism. You'll recall the climax, of course, uh, when the two drunken fishermen try to calm each other after their dinghy springs a leak. We'll get help when we hit land, I'm sure of it. No more big waves, no more sharks. We'll be safe once again, we'll be home. If you visit the Lilly Library at the University of Indiana and look at Gordon Lish's papers, you'll see how, with but a few deft strokes, he pared that down to create the now legendary ending, Help Land Shark. It wasn't what Ray Carver intended, but few could argue that it was not shorter. Rule number five, keep a dream diary. Rule number six, <laughs> what's not said is as important as what is said. In many classic short stories, the real action occurs in the silences. Try to keep all the good stuff off the page. The next time some real world practice might help. The next time your partner comes home, ignore his or her existence for 30 minutes and then blurt out, this is it, and drive the car onto the neighbor's lawn. <laughs> when your child approaches at bedtime, squeeze their shoulder meaningfully and, if you're a woman, smear your lipstick across your face with the back of your wrist. <laughs> or if you're a man, weep violently until they say, it's okay, dad. Drink out of a chipped mug, a souvenir from a family vacation or weekend getaway in better times, one that can trigger a two-paragraph compare-contrast description later on. It's a bit like method acting, but you'll get the hang of it. Simply let this thought guide your every word and gesture. Something is wrong. Can you guess what it is? If you're going for something a little more pomo, repeat the above, but with fish. Rule number seven, writer's block is a tool. Use it wisely. When asked why you haven't produced anything lately, just say, I'm blocked. Since most people think that writing is some mystical process where your characters talk to you and you can hear their voices in your head, being blocked is the perfect cover for this don't feel like working. The gods of creativity bless you, they forsake you, it's out of your hands and whatnot. Writer's block is like, we couldn't get a babysitter or I ate some bad shrimp an excuse that always gets a pass. But don't overdo it. The same way the babysitter bit loses credibility when your kids are off in grad school, there's an expiration date. After 20 years, you might want to mix it up. Throw in a Ralph Ellisonian, oops, my house caught fire and burnt up my opus. The specifics don't matter. The important thing is to figure out what works for you. Rule number eight is secret. Rule number nine, have adventures. The Hemingway mode was in ascendancy for decades until it was eclipsed by trendy, fabulous exercises. The pendulum is swinging back, though, and it's going to knock these effete eggheads right out of their Aeron chairs. Keep ahead of the curve. Get out and see the world. It's not going to kill you to butch it up for once. Book passage on a tramp steamer. Rustle up some dysentery. It's worth it for the fever dreams alone. Lose a kidney in a knife fight. You'll be glad you did. Rule number 10, revise, revise, revise. I cannot stress this enough. Revision is when you do what you should have done the first time, but didn't. It's like washing the dishes two days later instead of right after you finish eating. Get that draft counter going. Remove a comma, and then print out another copy. That's another draft right there. Do that enough times, and you can really get those numbers up, which will come in handy if someone, someone challenges you to a draft off. When the referee blows the whistle and your opponent goes 26 drafts, 
you bust out with 317 and send him to the mat. And finally, rule number 11. There are no rules. If everyone jumped off a bridge, would you do it too? No. There are no rules except the ones you learned during your show and tell days. Have fun. If they don't want to be friends with you, they're not worth being friends with. And most of all, just be yourself. So that's Jim Phillips, and um, the anthology will be out any day now, I'm sure. Um, so I'll read from Zone 1, which is just out in paperback. Uh, that's why I'm here. Uh, it's about zombies, so that makes it my second autobiographical novel in a row. And um, I'll start with the first page. The first line, in fact. He always wanted to live in New York. You know, just seeing those words reminds me of when I put that sentence down three years ago. Um, it's always exciting, exciting when you start a new book. It's a time of optimism. Um, you're excited, you convince yourself, this time I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna get it right. I'm not gonna fuck it up like I did last time and all the other times. Um, and then you sit down to write that first magical day and you have all your notebooks and little jottings and outlines in front of you and you look at the blank page and remember that writing a novel is the shittiest job in the world. Why are you putting yourself through this agony? For what? Everyone's going to hate it like they did last time. If you actually remembered how horrible it is to write a book, you would never write a second one. Um, it's like having a baby. I know some people don't like it when you compare the miracle of childbirth to uh, the creative process, but I think there must be some overlap between the two, if only in terms of sheer agony. Um, obviously, I've never, I'm a man, I've never passed a human baby through my pee pee hole, but I figure it must hurt. Um, <laughs> because a human baby is like um, this big when it comes out. Um, and that must be incredibly painful. And yet some women have two, three, four, five, six babies. Um, so I figure you have to forget how much it would hurt, it hurts, or else you would never do it again. Um, but I'll go back to zone one, paperback. Take it from the top. He always wanted to live in New York. And once again, I find myself distracted by the idea of what a strange, strange thing it is to write a book. Um, I'm not sure why I changed things up with Zone 1. Um, it was the first time I wrote the whole book without showing anybody a single word. Um, maybe I was trying to recreate uh, some of the atmosphere of the book, uh, the psychology of the characters who are also alone in their bunkers, on the run, not sure if they'll make it to the end. Um, usually I can make it through the first third of a book or the first hundred pages before I have to show somebody just to get a reality, ch reality check. Um, writing a book about elevators, does it make sense, am I an idiot? And then if they sort of sign off on it, I can continue towards the end. Um, with Sag Harbor, uh, which was a more personal book, uh, I guess that's when I first started mixing it up. Um, because I, I had a lot of weird anxieties over whether or not I could pull it off. It wasn't my usual thing. Uh, human emotions on the page. Um, I wasn't used to having myself out there so much, so each time I finished a chapter, I was sent off to my agent, who's a really good reader, and also she's British, so there's, and there's a lot of pop culture in the book. So I would run by, you know, various references through, you know, by her to see if they're working. Uh, to serve the book, even if you didn't grow up in the 80s and didn't follow like UTFO and run DMC. And so each time I send her a chapter, I finish a chapter, I would send her also YouTube clips of like music videos and um, a new Coke commercial, uh, The Cosby Show, because The Cosby Show, you know, figures into Sag Harbor. And I remember when I showed her, I sent her the video for The Message by Grandmaster Flash and The Furious Five. She's very excited because it's filled, of, it's filled of bombed out Harlem streets and rubble-strewn avenues. And um, 
Uh, that's what she thought New York looked like when she moved here. It had been cleaned up by Giuliani, so she was very excited to have like this glimpse uh, into old New York. Um, she's a good reader. I rely on her. You have to pick your readers uh, carefully. Uh, some people are good at line editing. Others are good at structure. Um, and you can't use the same person over and over because it's an imposition to read someone's unedited 500-page manuscript. Uh, it's you know, a real pain. I remember when I sent Sag Harbor to someone who'd seen a lot of my previous, read a lot of my, my previous books, and uh, she was taking a lot of time getting back to me. And so I started freaking out because it was like a personal book. And the weeks went by, and the months went by, and finally I was like, have you read it? And she was like, yeah. So I was like, well, what do you think? And she said, I think I like the main character of Lila May in the Intuitionist more. I don't like the main character of Sag Harbor. And I was like, you know, this character is basically me, right? Um, she was like, yeah. And I was like, you understand that we're married, right? And um, she was like, yeah, that's what makes this so awkward. Um, so, but zone one. New novel, uh, Alan Pearback, awesome. I'll just start the reading again from the very uh, first line from the top. <clears throat> he always wanted to live in New York. Have I actually said what the book is about yet? Uh, it's about zombies, sure. Um, perhaps I should explain my personal connection. I've always been sort of neurotically fixated uh, with zombies for the last like 35 years uh, or so. Um, I had very permissive parents and it allowed me to see a lot of like horror and science fiction before it was, before it was age appropriate. Um, I remember seeing A Clockwork Orange with my parents on HBO when I was like 10 and uh, being like, mommy, what are those guys doing to that woman? And she was like, shh, it's a comment on society. <laughs> Shut your trap. Um, and uh, soon after that, I think I was like 11, when I first saw Dalma Dead, uh, which was rated X for excessive gore. And pretty soon right after that, I started having zombie anxiety dreams. Some people have anxiety dreams about being late for an exam or uh, they're unprepared for the presentation. For the last, since I saw Dawn the Dead, I've had zombie anxiety dreams where I'm being chased by fast zombies, slow zombies. They get me, I escape, uh, I'm alone, I'm with a, a band of human survivors. And I'll basically have like once a month for like 30 something years. And then um, about three years ago, it was July, fourth weekend, and I, I was having some guests out to Long Island. And I probably shouldn't have because I was going through some personal stuff. And once I got out there, and we woke up Saturday morning, got to hear them like laughing and seeing downstairs. All I could think of was like, can you guys please go? I should be alone. Um, you can hear everybody's laughter because it's the walls are very thin. Uh, it's basically like a no sex house, which I always try to make clear before you get out there. Um, the spare room's made up. Uh, please bring some organic greens. It's a no sex house. We'd love to see you there. Um, so I couldn't face them. I was too depressed and they were too upbeat. So I just willed myself back to sleep. And I had a dream, and in the dream, um, I guess it was a nightmare because uh, I woke up in an apartment in Manhattan. I live in Brooklyn. That's how I knew it was a nightmare, I guess. <laughs> and then uh, I wanted to go into the living room, but I wasn't sure if I could because I didn't know if they'd swept the zombies out yet. And then so I woke up and I was like, well, that's a weird dream, but also a real logistical concern when you are cleaning up after the apocalypse, how do you get rid of the extra zombies? They sort of hang around like bad house guests. And I started writing it that day. It's not often that you have a dream that turns into a book. Usually uh, I'll have a dream and it's like, sex with my mom again? And that's not really a book length. <laughs> Short story. So I was really excited to get a book out of it, and I started working that day. Um, uh, I'll get back to the first page, start my reading off. Apologize to the strands. Um, from the top, one, one more time. 
He always wanted to live in New York. And I guess ultimately what I think of when I read that line once again is what's next? You have to keep moving if you're uh, trying to stay vital as an artist. Uh, keep pushing yourself or what's the point? So I'm torn between two projects right now. I'm not sure which one to continue. Uh, usually if you have two projects, whichever one I'm thinking about more is the one I end up pursuing. So I'm almost at that stage. Um, what the first idea is a real departure for me. It's a love story. A, a love story set on the eve of the Russian Revolution. Um, there are a lot of white people in it, so for research, I'm watching a lot of Golden Girls. Um, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. And then the other one is probably more obvious. It's science fiction, uh, a genre that's much, much, much closer to my heart. Um, science fiction, but science fiction uh, specifically set in the Star Wars universe. Um, I know George Lucas is really protective of his intellectual property, uh, but if you ask me, copyright is an outmoded concept, like being happy or falling in love. Um, I think there are a lot of unanswered questions in the Star Wars universe, the way it stands now, and I think that I'm sort of uniquely qualified to address them. Um, like in the first movie, for example, uh, that came out, uh, Star Wars, uh, they have the Death Star, which is a, a weapon the size of a moon. And then they have lightsabers, which are literally swords made out of laser. And uh, they have hyperspace, faster than light drive, that enables you to travel across the universe in half a second. And yet R2-D2 can't get a fucking voice box. Um, uh, you know, it's always just like, um, he's the smartest character in all the movies, and he can't even talk. Luke Skywalker gets his hand cut off, he gets a robot hand. Darth Vader falls into a, a lava pit, he gets a whole new robot body. Uh, the Death Star gets destroyed, they make a whole new Death Star that's the size of a planet. Um, and R2-D2 can't get a fucking voice box. Uh, it's not a technology issue, because C-3PO can talk, a lot of the droids talk. Um, C-3PO is always running his mouth. Uh, like uh, when they land on Tatooine, uh, the desert planet in Star Wars, before they get picked up by the Jawas, who you recall are sort of like space crackheads. Um, <laughs> they get stolen property and they get all furtive. It's like, where'd you get that land speeder? It's like, oh, it fell off a truck. Uh, it's my aunt's, five dollars. Um, but before they get picked up by the space crackheads, uh, C-3PO and R2-D2 are wandering the desert. And C-3PO says, I dare say the desert sand is burning my feet. And R2-D2 goes um, but, if you know, but if you could speak, you know what he's really saying is, Princess Leia's been kidnapped. I have the blueprints of the Death Star in my chest. Uh, Darth Vader's trying to destroy the universe. And this silly motherfucker is talking about how the sand is hot on his feet. Um, that's what I'd like to explore in my next novel. And um, I guess I'm out of time. So uh, maybe I'll read from Zone 1 next time. I'd like to thank you guys again for coming out. And uh, if you have any questions, I would love to answer them. <laughs> or if you have any advice for me. Howdy. Who's some of your favorite science I'm not so, I mean, I'm not so much up on contemporary science fiction. You know, I guess in junior high and high school, it was Isaac Asimov, um, uh, Ray Bradbury. Uh, William Gibson was starting to come out with his stuff. Now, um, Neil Stevenson, I still sort of pick him up. Uh, but I'm not really necessarily sort of well-versed in what's sort of contemporary. Of his books? Well, um, yes, I mean, I was a, sort of like a shut-in as a kid, I read a lot of comic books, and um, uh, a lot of horror, and a lot of Stephen King. So that was like, you know, 79, 80, and my older sisters and my mom would buy all the Stephen King stuff, so 
that was the, you know, um, uh, Cujo, Night Shift, Carrie, uh, The Shining, Salem's Lot. Um, that sort of great run you had, like in the mid, you know, mid 70s to early 80s. And, um, like, until I went to college, like, I wanted to write, like, The Black Shining or The Black Salem's Lot. Um, and you see, even King Tyler, if you put the, the black in front of it, that's, like, what I wanted to do. Uh, but I still am very fond of, like, that. And, of course, um, The Stand. Yes, The Stand. Howdy. Uh, I've only had one since I finished the book, so I think they're basically gone. It's only been like nine months since I had one. But then I do readings and people are like, oh, I have zombie dreams now because of your book, which I'm totally fine with. You know, I had, I had enough. Um, I'll need to, you know, other people can have them for a while. Um, you know, I don't classify it. I, I would call it like a horror novel. I guess that genre um, has some sci-fi-ish uh, elements. I sort of see it taking place like in four years in the future, but it's not really heavily sci-fi. Um, so, you know, other people are more sort of hung up on level, le labels than I am. For me, it's just like a, a novel um, and um, definitely more horror than I've probably done before or probably will ever do again, frankly. No, it does. I mean, um, the first 10 minutes of that movie are incredibly scary and suspenseful. Um, and then there's a lot of bad writing and mediocre acting. Like, they have the dog, like, there's a whole subplot with the dog, which is totally, well, I can't say ludicrous, it's about zombies. But, you know, it's just really dumb having that sort of dog subplot. And then, um, but the last minute is, like, really nihilistic, so. Um, I'm a purist, so I like slow zombies. You know, fast zombies are scary in their own way. But for me, um, uh, like the mob of slow zombies is what actually I find scarier than one sort of superhero-y uh, fast zombie. Um, in my, in attempting to figure out what zombies meant to me, you know, obviously I, I got sort of stuck in some sort of neurotic way in junior high. Um, uh, for me, like a, a zombie is someone who stopped pretending. So it's like someone, the, the terror of the, the zombie apocalypse or invasion of body snatchers with pod people is that people who, you fall asleep and you wake up and the world has changed, the people who you love, your family, your friends, your neighbors are finally revealing themselves to be the monsters they are. And that has nothing to do with being fast. Uh, it has something to do with like, the sort of um, uh, act of humanity that most people are engaged in. And once they stop acting, they're monsters. And so I connect that more with like Night Living Dead and the first Dead trilogy. Um, some of the more, um, I like um, uh, 20 Days Later. For me, that's a zombie text, even though they're not dead. It's like a virus or whatever. Um, so I'm not really up on contemporary zombie stuff. In terms of fiction, it would be Max Brooks' World War Z, which I think is incredible, and The Walking Dead comics. Um, I think the TV show is still trying to find its footing, but... So. All right, well, it was very nice of you guys to come out. Um, I'll see you, see you next time, I guess. <laughs> Thanks.